Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Megan and I am doing the Love Dare Challenge by Alex and Stephen Kendrick. And today, I'm, in this video, I am doing uh, 37 through 39. Guys, we are almost done with this challenge. There's, it's a 40 day challenge and we are going to be going up to 39 in this video. But today we're doing chapter, or right now I'm doing chapter, or day 37, and it is Love Agrees in Prayer. If two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father. It's Matthew 18, 19. If someone told you that by changing one specific thing about your marriage, you could guarantee with nearly 100% assurance that your life together would be significantly improved, you would at least want to know what it was. Okay, shh. When you talk, they can't hear me. Uh, countless couples have discovered this one thing to be the regular practice of prayer together. To someone who tends to devalue scripture matters, this may seem ridiculous. But the unity that grows between a man and woman who regularly pray together forms an intense and powerful connection. Within the sanctuary of marriage, shared prayer becomes a highly effective weapon in your battle of for marital longevity, while others heighten your sense of sexual in intimacy. It can truly work wonders on every level of your relationship. When husband and wife talk to God together, something amazing happens. Jesus said, for example, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their, in their midst. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Though Jesus' words apply to all believers, they certainly apply to Christian marriages. United prayer actually ushers the presence of God into your marriage in a special way accompanied by the love, joy, and peace you long to experience in your home. It happens each time you join hands together to approach the throne of grace. So, I want when you okay. were joined as husband and wife, God gave you a wedding Dad. gift, a permanent Dad. prayer partner for Dad. life, someone who can help Dad. take all Dad. your praying Dad. to Dad. the Dad. next Dad. level. When you need wisdom on a certain decision, you and your mate can seek God together for the answer. When you're struggling with personal fears and insecurities, your prayer partner can hold your hand and intercede on your behalf. When you and your spouse are getting along and can't seem to get past a particular argument or sticking point, you can call a timeout, timeout, drop your weaponry, weaponry and go with your partner into emergency intercession prayer should become your first response and your automatic reflex when you don't know what else to do it's hard to stay angry for for long with someone you're praying for it's hard not to go back when you're hearing your mate humbly cry out to the god for mercy in the midst of your heated crisis in prayer, a husband and wife remember that God has made them one, and in the grip of his uniting presence, disharmony blends into beauty. The word Jesus used, in fact, about agreeing your prayer carries the idea of harmonious symphony. When two different notes are played together, they create a fuller, more complete sound than either of them can accomplish on their own. Likewise, when we bring our divergent views and personalities together in prayer, God joins those together in harmony. Agreeing in prayer, even in the midst of disagreeing, pulls us both back toward our real center. It places us on common ground face to face before the Father. The church, which in scripture has a marriage continuation with Christ, is a place where Disharmony can sometimes flare up and derail members from their mission while disrupting their worship and unity. At times, when godly church leaders sense this taking place, they will break off further discussions and call the people of God to prayer. Instead of continuing to discord and allowing more feelings to be hurt, 
They will seek to restore unity by turning their hearts back to God and re appealing together for help. The same thing happens in our homes when we let prayer intervene at high points of disagreement. It stops the bleeding. It quiets the loud voices. It pauses our painful passion as we realize whose presence we're in. But prayer can do a lot more than just break up fights. Prayer is a privilege to be enjoyed on a consistent daily basis. Prayer for your, praying for your spouse leads your heart to care more deeply about them. Hearing him or her pray for your needs, your protection, and God's blessing over your life is an intimate experience that can deepen your love and feelings for one another. When you know that prayer time awaits for you before going to bed at night, it will change the way you spend your evening. Even if your prayers are short and to the point, they'll become a standing appointment you each orbit your day around, keeping God in the middle of everything, where He should be. It's true the beginning a habit like this can initially feel foreign or awkward, but anything in this power will surprise you with its long-term results as you actually try doing it. The more you practice it, in fact, the more it will become a natural part of your time together. And more importantly, God will be pleased when he sees you both humbling yourselves and seeking his face, face together. You'll look back in this common thread that ran through everything from average Mondays to major decisions and be so thank thankful you're invested yourself in this one thing that so deeply changes everything. This is one area where it is imperative that you agree to agree. Today's dare. Ask your spouse if you can begin praying together. Talk about the best time to do this, whether it's in the morning, your lunch hour, or before bedtime. Use this time to commit to your concerns, your disagreements, and your needs before the Lord. Don't forget to thank Him for His provision and blessing. Even if your spouse refuses to do this, resolve to spend this daily time in prayer yourself. How did your mate respond to your request to pray together? If you agreed to do it, what was it like? What did you learn from it? And I said, I mentioned it to David, and he said, we, we already do. I told him not just before meals or bed. He didn't really say anything after that, so I may just go pray with him randomly one day or ask him about it again later. And um, it says, for a simple guide on how to pray together, we are going to go to the appendix. Oh, and I... Um, before I do that, a Bible verse that goes along with this is, In the morning, my prayer book comes before you. Psalms 18, 88, 13. Okay, let's go to appendix real quick. It says, How to pray together. Devote yourself a prayer that stay alert in it with thanksgivings. Colossians 4, 2. Praying together as a couple is a priceless privilege with endless benefits. But too many to but to many this is a new idea that could be a little intimidating at first. Many people regulate prayer to standard situations, church, meal times, bedtimes, waiting rooms, but we will daily miss opportunities to embrace the privilege God has given us to bring every need and concern to him in immediate prayer together. As husband and wife, prayer together should not only preclude your days and your decisions, but it should also be your instant refuge at the first hint of fear, doubt, and concern. Any crisis should call you to immediate prayer together rather than panic. When you hear of a national disaster, a family emergency, or a friend diagnosed with cancer, take each other by the hand and rush headlong together to the throne of grace. Even at the discovery of good news, a united prayer of thanks will honor God for his blessing and deflect any temptation to take credit for it. Start now, even the situations are not particularly dire and dangerous, and let prayer become your automatic response for both a big and small life ahead. At first, you might not know what to say. Don't uh, let that worry you. The key is to be humble and honest before God by simply admitting 
that you are going through and then officially asking for his help. Do not try to impress your spouse with sacred sounding words. Also, take advantage of the Lord's model prayer found in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It's not a mantra to be repeated by a God to be, by a God to be followed. Jesus didn't say this is what to pray, but how to pray. It contains as many as six different types of petitions in the space of its few words. You and your spouse can use it for direction as you pour out your hearts to him. Your praying can take on many forms. Thank him for the good things he has done for you that has come to mind and praise him for how, for how awesome he is. Repeatedly confess any sins you have committed and seek his mercifulness, forgiveness. merciful forgiveness. Pray by asking God specifically for what you need. Tell him you receive his love for you while also verbally expressing your love back to him. Cry out in desperation for wisdom, strength, and guidance in the great and small decisions that lie before you. Surrender to him and ask him to change your heart. Ask him to make your marriage something amazing that pleases him. Most important, bring yourself to a place where you are willing to say, May your will be done. Then go on by Go on into the day alive with expectancy of seeing him work mightily around you and leveling through you for his glory. That's the video for 37, day 37. Now I'm going to go on and go to 38. Okay, day 38 is Love Fulfills Dreams. And it says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's Psalms 37, 4. What is something your spouse would really, really love? And how often do you ask yourself that question? Common sense tells us we can't give our wife or husband everything they might like. Our budgets and our account balances tell us we probably can't afford it anyway. And even if we could, we're too busy and probably don't have time. But perhaps you've gotten into, you've let your no become too quick of a response. Perhaps you become too reasoned and rational, too automatic. What if instead of dismissing this thought, you awakened your best to honor it? What might happen if the one thing your husband or wife said you'd never be able to do for them but became the next thing you did? Love sometimes needs to be extravagant, to go all out, to set aside the technicalities, open up the floodgates of generosity, and bless someone out of sheer delight. Is that thinking too much like a teenager? Is that kind of a love no longer on the menu after this many years of marriage? After all, with the way your relationship might be at the moment, wouldn't it be disingenuous to indulge your spouse if your heart's not in it? Well, how about putting your heart in it? How about adopt, adapting to a new level of love that actually wants to fulfill every dream and desire you possibly can? I'm going to repeat that. Well, how about putting your heart in it? How about adopting a new level of, of love that actually wants to fulfill your dream and desires, desire you possibly can? Did you know God loves with extravagance? He goes over and above. He pours out freely beyond measure. The Bible says he lavished his grace on us, Ephesians 1, 8, that Jesus' love provides us with abundant love but overflowing beyond limitation. That's John 10, 10. And we as his disciples are called to give that same kind of extravagant love, to give more than we've asked, to go the extra mile, to greatly exceed what is expected as Matthew 5 39 through 45 and I like that so I'm going to repeat that and we as his disciples are called to give that same kind of extravagant love to give more than we're asked to go the extra mile to greatly exceed what is expected Matthew 5 39 through 45 hasn't God's love met needs in your heart that hasn't God's love met needs in your heart that way you were living under a load of sin and regret. 
You thought you'd, you'd never earn your way back into his good graces. Yet he looked at you with love and said you didn't have to. He wanted you back and showed you mercy. As he turned to him, as you turned to him, he he forgave you. God being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ Ephesians 2 4 through 5 so it wasn't when you were behaving like an angel that God chose to pour out his love on you it wasn't because you were so deserving that he offered you his grace although you weren't a likely candidate he loved you anyway he freely paid the price for you and he is the one your love is designed to in, imitate. His world says that his love, cheerful, hilarious givers like himself. At 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Those who are willing to give in abundance out of pure delight. What expected gift could you start saving up for that could overwhelm your spouse with love? A new dishwasher? diamond earrings, a better car, and I said, um, David really wants to go back to Mexico, like we did on our honeymoon, so I said, maybe a trip to Mexico, like our honeymoon. He would love that. Um, where could you quietly arrange to get away for a romantic weekend, just the two of you? A friend's cabin, a nearby hotel, or a cruise ship? Not anything your spouse wants has to be a hefty price tag or can even be bought with money. You could secretly tackle a big project that has been on your mate's wish list for months. Or really, your wife may just want your time and attention at home. She may want to be treated like a lady and know that her husband considers her a treasured, uh, treasure. Tre tre cherished treasure. She may want a warm embrace and to see you in your eyes a love that chooses her all over again will be there no matter what your husband the main thing he may want is some greater respect he may want you to acknowledge him as the head of the house in front of the children he may want you to surprise him with a with a long kiss or a love note or to invite him home for lunch with you as a dessert when <laughs> when there's not even a birthday anniversary to justify it he may need you to know that you still think he's strong and handsome to you dreams and desires come in all shapes and sizes but love thinks lavishly while taking careful notes of each each one so I love these ideas Listen between the lines, discover what your mate is hoping for or really needing. And I said, I think I'm pretty good when it comes to presents. Remember special things that are unique to your relationship or see how you could create new memories during this season in, in your lives, of your lives. Give when it would be a lot more convenient to wait. Daydream about opportunities so often that planning surprises become second nature. We dare you to think in terms of overwhelming your spouse with love to exceed all your expectations with your surprising kindness. Whether it's a free or financial sacrifice, it needs to reflect your thoughtfulness and heart, willing to express yourself with extravagance. One of the greatest regrets people have later in life that they didn't love each other more fully when they had the chance. Now is your chance. What is something your spouse would really, really love? Is it time you start living out the answer to that question? It's time to start living out the answer to the question. Um, today's dare. Ask yourself what your mate would want if it was attainable. Commit this to prayer and start mapping out a plan for meeting some, if not all, of their desires to whatever level you possibly can. What has made you resistant to filling your mate's desires in the past? How would it change your relationship if they knew their dream would be priority to you? What desires are you attempting to meet? And I said, David really wants to go back to Mexico where we went on our honeymoon. He said it was the best trip ever, but we haven't been able to afford it. 
We've had two kids, and I'm scared it's too dangerous now. And I said, if I think, I think if I allow David to have some of my stimulus check, um, I wrote this a little, little way back, and actually this was when we thought we might get a second stimulus check, and I don't think we're, I don't think we're going to. I haven't heard about it, but um, I said we could go, and I told them, I already told them this already but I don't know if he fully believed me I'm going to pray about it though his desires I would be meeting would be that we would get away just the two of us we both are in some need of some R&R &R. okay a Bible verse that goes with this is God is able to make all grace abound to you for 2 Corinthians 9 8 and then a late man I guess it could be a lady but probably a man named Jay said I will fight to the very end for my marriage. Not because I had to, because I want to. Okay, day 39. Love endures. And that is, love never fails, 1 Corinthians 13, 8. When storms arise and conditions worsen, love chooses to endure through even the toughest issues. Though threatened, it keeps pushing. Though challenged, it keeps moving forward. Though mistreated and rejected, it refuses to give up. Love never fails. Many times when a marriage is in crisis, the spouse who is trying to make things work will go to the other, declaring in plain terms that no matter what has happened in the past, they are committed to this marriage. Their love can be counted on to last. They promise. But the other spouse, not wanting to hear it yet, holds their position. They still want out. They don't see this marriage lasting long term, nor do they even want it to last anymore. The partner who has just laid his or her, her eye, heart out on the line, extending the olive branch, can't handle the rejection. So they withdraw their statement. Fine. If that's the way you want it, that's the way it will be. But if love is really love, it doesn't waffle when it's not received the way you want. If love can be told to quit loving, then it's not really love. <laughs> Thor agrees. Love that is from God is unending, unstoppable. If the object of its affection doesn't choose to receive it, love keeps giving anyway. Love never fails. Never. That's what Jesus' love is like. His disciples were nothing if not unpredictable. After their final Passover meal together, when Jesus told them that they would all forsake him before the night was over, Peter declared, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Matthew 26, 33, 35. All the other disciples echoed the very same promise. But later that night, Jesus' uh, inner circle of followers, Peter, James, and John, would sleep through the Christ's agony in the garden instead of supporting him. Peter would later deny him three times in the courtyard. Jesus' men had failed him within hours of their sworn promises. G um, yet he never stopped loving them, and he came back to restore them, because he and his love are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is Hebrews 13, 8. When you have done everything within your power to obey God, your spouse may still forsake you and walk away, just as Jesus' followers did to him. But if your marriage fails, if your spouse walks away, let it not be because you gave up or stopped loving them, because love never fails. Paul endured beating, beatings, intense persecution, and hardship throughout his life. He did it for one reason alone, because Christ's love compelled him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 14. But how? Of the nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5, the first of all is love. 
And because the unchanging Holy Spirit is its source, the same Spirit who dwelled in Paul, and the heart of believers, the love he creates in us is unchanging as well. No challenge or circumstance can put an expiration date on it. The love of God is anchored in the will of God, the calling of God, and the word of God. All unchanging things. The Bible declares them irrevocable. Romans 11:29. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Luke 21:33. The reason you were challenged a few days ago to build your marriage on the word of God is because when all else fails, the truth of love of God will stand. Since each quality of love outlined in this book is based on the love of God expressed in his unchanging word of God, then your love as a believer bears the same unchanging characteristics. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love never fails. When a marriage crumbles, couples often blame the failure of their relationship on irreconcilable differences. But genuine, genuine love is a master of reconciliation. When love takes... Over, it compels us to humbly apologize and take full responsibility for our failures, then to fully forgive when our spouse, has, our spouse has failed us. Over and over again, resilient marriages are built on honesty, respect, commitment, forgiveness, and endurance. And love constantly inspires all of all these things to grow and to thrive within us hi simba say hi okay keep walking sorry guys so today your dare is to put your unfilling love into the most powerful personal personal words you can this is your chance to declare and print that no matter what imperfections exist both you both in you and in your spouse your love is is greater your love is greater still no matter what they've done or or how often they've done it you choose to love them anyway though you've been far from steady yourself in the way you've treated them in your marriage over the years your days of your inconsistent love in love are finished you accept this one man or woman as a God's special gift to you, and you promise to love them until death. You're saying to your spouse, regardless of what has happened to us in the past, regardless of our many mistakes, and regardless of your feelings toward me, I choose to love you anyway, now and forever. Because love never fails. Okay, today's dare is... Spend time in personal prayer, then write a letter of commitment and resolve to your spouse. Include why you are committing to this marriage until death and that you have purpose to love them no matter what. Leave it in a place that your mate will find it. And then it says, what were some of the hesitations you had in writing this letter? How do you expect your spouse to respond to it? How did God help you in writing it and what did the process teach you about yourself? I did pray over it, and I did exactly what it said. It was saying, um, write a letter of commitment and resolve to your to your spouse. And um, I felt like God was also telling me to add in stuff from this book. So it ended up being like a 50, not quite 50 pages long. Um, I gave it to him this morning, and I wasn't going to say anything about it. And... Uh, he eventually came up to me and said that he wasn't done. He got it and he wasn't done reading it. He said that he was scared that I was going to... He brought up an episode of Friends. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but... And I can't even remember who gave it to who, but they were getting mad at the other one because they fell asleep while reading it. <laughs> and um, at least I think that's how it went. And... Uh, 
so I was I'm like, nope, that's fine. I wasn't going to say anything. I know it's long. I know it might take a while to read. And, uh, and he works during the day, so he, he reads it on his breaks. But he also said when he first got it, and I hope he's joking about this, but he said that when he saw it, he, and he saw it was really long, he thought I was like, wrote a letter that I took Hannah off somewhere and I was going to come back to get James and <laughs> I was leaving him. I, I don't know. I don't know why he said that. I think he was joking. He better be joking because I've been doing my, going through this love there and I'm trying to show him how much I love him lately. And I, I, So I do think he was joking about that. But anyway, I was just like, no, I'm just telling you how much I love you and I'm so committed to you. Um, but no, I think he appreciated it. He just hadn't had a chance to read it all. But um, it says, what are some of the hesitations you had writing in this letter? I really didn't have any hesitations. I When I started this Love Dare book, I was committed to this Love Dare. And I've been trying to do every dare in here and make our marriage the best that it can be. We didn't start off rocky or anything. I just wanted to make it, like I said, the best that it can be. How do you expect your spouse to respond to it? When I gave it to David, I wasn't really sure how he was going to respond. I knew he'd probably be grateful. Um, I didn't expect him to, to joke that he thought I was going to leave him. But <laughs> I can't get over that. <laughs> I really, really hope he thought I was kidding. Um, he laughed when he said it, so I think so. But anyway, um, I knew it, it would probably take him some time to read it, and I just hope it all makes sense, and some of the things in there that I think God had me write in it, I hope David takes it to heart. So, um, how did God help you in writing it, and what did the process teach you about yourself? Um, God gave me the words to say. He, he gave me, he gave me this book. He, he told me what I should write, and I did. And what did the process teach you about yourself? This process of writing the letter taught me that even though I've done this Love Dare book, um, there's still so much more I can do. And there's so many promises that I've made to David, and I want to keep them. I want to be the best wife I can be. Because he deserves it, and I love him, and he's my husband, and love never fails, and I don't want to fail him, and I'm with him to the end. All right, that is the end of this video. We are almost to the end, guys. Um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell so you never miss any of my videos. All right, until next time. Bye.